We are continuing our sermon series on the book, The Seven Churches in Revelation. And we heard a few weeks back now when George gave that summary of the entire book of Revelation that basically it, it sums down to two, these two main things. Number one, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a child of God. And is, he has given you that promise of life everlasting with him in heaven. And number two, if you reject Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are destined for eternal hell. Well, that's the summary. <laughs> so then we look through the rest of Revelation and we say, what? What is going on here? And there's some scholars that they look at these churches and, and they say, well, they're different people. They're in a different town, a different era, different time, situations. They're totally different than us. It doesn't speak to us in that same way as, it, as this letter from John did then to Sardis. And then I read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So this scripture, this letter, this word of God was chosen by God for a purpose that it would be read today in our hearing, that we would hear it today. And there is something that God wants to place on our hearts through this message to the church in Sardis 2,000 years ago. So I'm, I'm preparing, and I, I know that, as all the scholars say, that this was a totally different people, totally different situation, different era. And so I'm trying to look for the deep, dark, you know, message, meaning here in this brief little verses. And so I did some research, and I learned about this town in Sardis. Sardis, totally different than West Omaha, right? So Sardis, some things about them is they valued education. Yeah, they really valued education. In fact, at Sardis, they even had the gymnasium, which lots of cities there in those Greek cities in Lydia, they had gymnasium schools where the students would come from preschool age to college age, and they'd learn their, their numbers and reading and writing, and they'd learn philosophy. And here in Sardis, in fact, they think it was co-ed, both boys and girls together learning, which was not normal for all the other towns, and they think everybody else was looking at them a little askew. What are they doing up there on that hill in Sardis? Co-ed learning. Um, they love their sports in their school also, in their gymnasium. Love sports, did that a lot. They also are very diverse in religion. So they have the synagogue, and they have the Christian church, and they have people who are still worshiping the old gods, Artemis, uh, the old Greek gods, and now the Roman gods as they've come in as well. So there's all these different religions, and they're kind of getting along. In fact, the Jewish synagogue is connected to the gymnasium, and the Christian church is built across the street from the gymnasium. And they're all learning together and playing sports together, and they're not persecuting each other, or beating up on one another. They're all getting along. And so I'm looking through her and I'm like, why are they so getting along? What's bonding them together? And it's that they're very good at business. This is the capital of Lydia, Sardis is. And uh, they think money, the minting of coins, Pastor Tyler would like that. <laughs> The minting of coins was started here, they think, that uh, there was a little river that came through, lots of gold dust came through, and they needed a currency in order to be doing all this business through the capital in order to sell their goods and make money. So um, this was a, a well-off town, and it was to everybody's benefit to get along with one another here. It was also very safe. Uh, this was a safe place with a wall up on a hill, so... Um, you know, nothing like West Omaha, right? Great education, diverse religions, mostly all getting along, pretty safe. You can raise a family there, uh, kind of like West Omaha or Fargo. You can find a job. It's a great place. Nothing like West Omaha. 
So, as I'm, you know, looking for the deep, dark message here, there isn't. It's not all that deep. It's obvious. And so I'm going to share with you the three obvious messages that you can read right here uh, from God to the church in Sardis. And maybe he's speaking to us here today also. So the first obvious message to the church in Sardis is, wake up. Wake up. I saw one kid jump over there. <laughs> Wake up. It's right there in, the, in Scripture. It says, Revelation 3, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. There is a warning here to a town who thinks they're very safe. They're well off. They're doing pretty good. They're not fighting with each other. They're up. They have walls. They're up on a hill. Nobody can get to them. And yet there's a warning. Wake up or you will be destroyed. Something is coming after you. Uh, my husband Mark a couple of years ago taught middle school Sunday school at East Campus. East Campus, that way is east. Uh, and uh, I have permission to tell a story from the, the students that he asked them, if you could go anywhere in the world, where would you go and why? And Sam and his partner both wanted to go to Germany. And his partner wanted to go to Germany and research his family heritage, see where his great-grandparents were from and where they lived and do some genealogy. And, and, and that was what he wanted to go to Germany for. Sam said then that he wanted to go to Germany and find a castle and hold up in there and prepare for the zombie invasion. <laughs> so, <laughs> where Sam has that right is that a German castle would be a very good place to prepare for an invasion. So I have a picture of a German castle. This is Wartburg Castle. I've been here to this one, way high up on a hill. I mean, you can't get there by scaling the side of the hill. Even when we visited, the bus could only take you so far, and then you had to walk the rest of this, like, winding pathway to get up there. Martin Luther held up in there for a while when he was... You know, they were out to get him, and so he held up there, grew his beard long, and he translated the Bible from uh, Greek and Latin into German for the first time while he was hiding up in here. You couldn't take over this castle. This was a good place to prepare for a zombie invasion. And uh, so Sardis, too, it's way high up on a hill. I have a picture here of where Sardis is, and this is the Acropolis, is what you would call that hill. Now, it wasn't up on the top of that ridge. Sardis would be a few thousand feet down the hill on the side. And that would be where the gymnasium, the synagogue, the um, marketplace where they would sell everything. And then the Christian church then was built across from there. And um, they had an old Lydian wall that went around all of that. And then the Romans also built a new wall that that made sure that all of the gymnasium and the synagogue and the church were all safe within those walls. And then a little further down that hill then would kind of be the suburbs where everybody lived. But if there was ever a threat, you could go up there behind that wall. Business could keep running. Worship could keep happening. School could keep happening and you would be safe. And nobody could come after you. Now, or maybe Sam uh, wasn't quite right, <laughs> was where the invasion was going to come from. Because the danger, the zombies, the people who were acting like they were alive but were really asleep, they weren't going to come from the outside. The danger came from the inside. Because the only way to take over this this town of Sardis, I mean, you had to climb up in the secret path up the hill and find that right entryway into the wall to take over this town. And it was guarded by people, by, by soldiers who were tough guys. There was no way you could take over this town unless those soldiers fell asleep. The people of Sardis knew this. So as they're listening and reading this message from John, from the Lord, saying don't fall asleep, they know the danger because the only times that Sardis was taken over was when those guards at those little pathways fell asleep and the enemy came and took them over. Wake up. Now, of course, we know even here in West Omaha where we feel pretty safe <laughs> physically and we're not too worried that, that uh, somebody's going to come and invade us or we're pretty safe. But we know, just as they did, that the Lord wasn't talking about uh, physical safety, 
but spiritually, that we are in danger spiritually. Sardis was physically safe, making money also, you know, great place to, to start a family, make a living, you're going to get along with your neighbors, but they were spiritually in danger. So it says, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. A Lutheran Church of the Master, we have a little phrase that kind of a catchphrase, and you might see it if you get an email from us or you see our little business cards, and that catchphrase is alive in Christ. Alive in Christ. But we can't be alive in Christ when we're putting our security in the things of this world, in physical security, instead of in Christ and him alone and what he has done. And so if we put all of our security in this world and our safety physically, we start to let our guard down spiritually. And uh, the evil one can take over ourselves, our homes, our families. And you maybe think, well, I'm safe spiritually because we come to church. We bring our kids to church. They're hearing the message in Sunday school. But yet are we warning them to stay awake? Are we warning them? That that evil one is out there. Are we warning them of, of sin, of vulnerabilities, of mortality, of the devil? When we don't do that, when we just assume they're safe spiritually because they are physically safe, then we open them up to invasion, to the evil one. To somebody coming into their lives and giving them a different message. And it's coming into their ears, into their eyes, into their hearts. Wake up is the message from the Lord to Sardis. Because until Christ comes again, he who has been victorious over sin, death, and the power of the devil, that's Jesus Christ. He won the war, but the battles are yet raging and that's what we're fighting today. And we need to warn our kids, warn one another. And wake up, stay on guard, do not fall asleep. That's the first obvious message right here in Scripture. The second obvious message is complete your work. Your work is unfinished. Complete it. We have a commission. We have a calling. In Matthew 28, Jesus says to us, it's his last words here. He says, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I will be with you to the very end of the age. This isn't a suggestion. It's a commission. It's a call. It's a sending out. We are his disciples. We are his apostles, the sent ones, going out now to tell others about Jesus Christ. It's a calling on our lives. And so we are called to complete our work. There are some things that are left unfinished. You know, it's kind of funny as I'm reading through Sardis, they're not getting yelled at like some of these other churches are for the things that they're doing. You know, there's no Jezebel. There's no specific things that you need to stop doing this or you're doing this wrong. That's not really in this part. So it could be one of a couple reasons. It could be that John's already written them off, that they're just that far gone. They're nearly dead. They're goners. They're already gone. You know, they were doing so many bad things, I'm not even going to bother to list it. There's those few good people who are still worthy of Christ. They'll be wearing white someday, but the rest of you, I'm not going to go through the listing of all the things that you're doing wrong. Or it might be that it's not necessarily that any of those particular things that they're doing are wrong. They're just not finishing their great commission. They're just not finishing what they've started. They're not completing their work. I mean, these things aren't bad. Doing sports isn't bad. Uh, getting along with other people, that's a good thing, right? Not bullying each other. Even making money. Money's neutral. It's neither good nor bad. It just is. But so is sports. But yet uh, we could use money or sports for for our glory or for God's glory? How would we use those things? 
And even getting along with people, uh, that's biblical. Freedom in Christ, Paul says. We have freedom in Christ to get along with one another, to even uh, be all things to all men in order to win others for Jesus so that they would come and believe in Jesus Christ because we're, we're eating food with them and we're living life with them. And then when they, they see their need for the Lord, we can tell them about Jesus Christ. We can be there for them. That's the freedom we have. But are the people in Sardis actually using their money for the glory of God or for themselves? Are they actually using sports and, and uh, school and being neighbors to one another to uh, tell them about Jesus? Are they telling their kids about Jesus? Are they obeying this great commission to make disciples of all nations? Or in all of their safety, have they given up their need for Jesus or their need to tell others about him? Revelation 3 says, I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. So here at Lutheran Church of the Master, God's blessed us richly, and I can see the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in our church, and there's a couple things that God has blessed us, and uh, he you do well because it's the Holy Spirit doing it through you. And one of the things that we do amazing here at this church is we have worship that is seeped in Scripture. We have biblical worship here. So if you come to a traditional service at Lutheran Church of the Master, you will have those green hymnals and we'll have the words up in the screen. But all of that liturgy, you know, those words you hear week after week, it all comes from the Bible. All of those words. So it might seem like, well, they're saying the same thing every week. Well, we're reading scripture every week. It's the word of the Lord. And then in uh, contemporary worship services, we sing these contemporary songs. They're not the same old green hymnal hymns, but now they're, they're new things. Maybe you hear them on the radio if you listen to Caleb or um, any of those Christian radio stations. These songs come from scripture, the words of the contemporary music that we sing are scriptural, are come from the Bible. And so worship is just seeped in scripture, in the word of God. And uh, it's a gift that we have here at our church. And a second gift that I see that the Lord is working in this place is you put your money where your heart is. Wow. Um, this place is so good at giving of your time, your talents, and your treasures. You, you love to give your, your money and put it toward the glory of God here. It's awesome. We're getting ready for the um, budget for 2013, and I get excited for budget time here because I get to plan out, wow, look at these things we get to do next year. We get to minister. We get to evangelize. We get to have missions. We get to um, teach up our children here. We get to do discipleship. We get to do all these cool things, and it's fun. And then in October, when we do our uh, stewardship sermons on time, talent, and treasures, you people like stewardship sermons. That's weird. <laughs> Never been to a place that doesn't mind stewardship sermons. You love it. It's so cool to see that heart that you have for giving. And with that strength of giving comes a weakness that you're not so good at receiving. In fact, I think in West Omaha, we are really bad at receiving. We are horrible at showing any kind of need, any kind of weakness, any kind of vulnerability, any kind of sin. We do not want help from someone else. We're the strong ones. We have a reputation to uphold. And our kids see that. And they hide too their struggles and their sins and their temptations. You know, as I prepare for next year's uh, 2013 budget, and this year I get to help with discipleship, and I'm looking at our plans for Bible studies and, and discipleship opportunities, and I think right now, and I'm hoping for more in the future, I'm praying, <laughs> Lord, for more. But now I think we have less than a quarter who are involved in discipleship, in Bible studies, in prayer groups. Because when you are in a small group, you become vulnerable 
to one another, to your brothers and sisters. You share your life. You need to lean on others for your weaknesses, and they give to you. I'm German. <laughs> we don't share these things. You know, I, charismatics did not come to my town when I grew up. <laughs> you know, we don't do laying on of hands. <laughs> we like to do things a little bit, you know, with some distance between one another. There is no distance between the Lord and us. He is coming after us. And we have a weakness in receiving. Because if we have this commission, this mission to go and to make disciples of all nations, we cannot do that if first we aren't disciples ourselves. We can't share Jesus if we're not receiving him first ourselves. We can't call others to repentance if we're not repenting. We can't tell others, you need Jesus, if we don't think that we need him. If we're so strong and we're so safe and we're doing all the things that we need, we're good. Isaiah 29 says, These people come near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up only of rules taught by men. Therefore, once more, I will astound these people with wonder upon wonder. The Lord will work in our midst. I know he will. <laughs> The Lord says, the wisdom of the wise will perish. The, intelligent of the intelligent, intelligence of the intelligent will vanish. When we only do a few of those things, and we do do some things just amazingly well here at Lutheran Church of the Master, but we only do some of those things, but we don't go all the way. There is work yet uncomplete, incomplete, <laughs> unfinished. We have something to do yet here. God has a call on our hearts. He's calling us into a relationship with him that we would receive, that we would be humble before him, that we would need him and him alone. We can't do it all. Revelation 3 says, Remember therefore what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. And repent means to turn. To turn from putting our safety in this world and to put all of our hope and all of our safety in Jesus Christ and him alone. So here's our first two obvious messages. Wake up and complete the work that you've been given to do. Not just to give, but to receive Christ Jesus. And then there's a third one here. And it's be alive. Don't be dead. <laughs> That's a pretty obvious message of this one. Don't be dead. Who wants to be dead? Be alive. Of course, for us to be born the first time, did you have anything to do with that? Or is that somebody else? The will of, of a man and a woman. And now here you are. <laughs> you didn't have anything to do with your first birth. What do you think you have to do with your second birth? As a child of God, but yet we're called be alive, and that's a work of the Holy Spirit. And God is calling you to rebirth. Revelation 3 says, I know your deeds, you have a reputation of being alive, you look pretty good, but you are dead in the inside. Whether that's uh, fully dead and you've never known Jesus Christ, or it's you have totally fallen away, or, or you're You've been coming to church and you're putting your strength in him. We're maybe at different walks with the Lord, but whether you're dead, whether you're alive, whether you're somewhere in between, the Lord wants you. He's calling you to a rebirth in Jesus Christ. So there's a story of this uh, man who dies, goes up to heaven, meets St. Peter at the pearly gates, and St. Peter's going to tell him, how he can get into heaven. And here are the rules. St. Peter says, here's how it works. You need a hundred points to make it into heaven. So you tell me all the things that you did in your life, all these good things, and we'll add up all those points. Some points for each of your good works here in your life on how good it was. And when you get a hundred points, you're in to heaven, St. Peter says. And so the man says, great, I can do this. And he starts listing it off. And he says, I was married to the same woman for over 50 years, and I never cheated on her, not even in my heart. St. Peter says, wonderful, that's worth three points. And the guy says, whoa, three points, okay. 
Better step it up here. He says, well, I attended church every Sunday. Even if I was sick, I came. And I tithed. I gave of my service. I gave of my money more than 10%, not just to the church, but to the, to the world. I gave lots of money. And, and St. Peter says, that's great. That's wonderful. Terrific. That's worth a point. And the man says, one point? Okay, how about this? I started a soup kitchen in my city, and I worked in a shelter for homeless veterans. And St. Peter says, fantastic, that's good for two more points. And the guy says, two points? At this rate, the only way I'm getting into heaven is by the grace of God. St. Peter says, you're in. <laughs> it's the grace of God that we're born again. It's the grace of God that we've been given life. It's not by any of our actions in this world, any of the security that we have, that we think we have. It's the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Otherwise, we're just pretending. And we're the zombies. And other people see our reputations, and they think we look pretty good. But in our hearts, have we been born to the Lord. John 3.16 is the most famous um, Bible verse, I think, ever. Uh, football players put it on their face when they're playing football. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus Christ, so that all those who would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. God so loved you that whatever your sins, the worst of the worst, if what you have done in it surely has. I don't know what you did, but I'm sure it was pretty horrible. And, and the only way you can be saved and the only way you can be given is through sacrifice of somebody pure. And that is God, his son, Jesus Christ, is the only one who's pure. And God loves you so much. He gave that pure son up to live this human life, to suffer like we suffer, and then to be killed, humiliated, die on the cross so you would be forgiven. You were loved so much that God wants you. And that's how willing he is to go, how far he will go to save you so that your life would not be over when this world is done but that you would have eternal life with your Father in heaven. It's amazing. A little earlier in John chapter 3, we hear the story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus has a pretty good reputation in his community. He is a Pharisee, a member of the Jewish ruling council. So his reputation is such that it's like he got voted onto the church council. <laughs> you know, he's wise. He's been around. He knows how it works in the life of the church. So Nicodemus is around and he doesn't want anyone to know though that he has doubts, that he has concerns, that he wants to know how to be saved. So, so to keep his reputation safe in the world amongst the other Jews, he goes at night to Jesus at night to the teacher to ask him how he can be saved, to ask him about this eternal life, to ask him about this forgiveness that he's hearing Christ talk about. He goes so that nobody else knows that Nicodemus is vulnerable. He goes secretively to Jesus, and Jesus tells him that he must be born again. And Nicodemus is thinking totally about this world still and how he you know, in this world, we're born of the flesh by mothers. He's like, how can that happen again? And, and Jesus says, no, you must be born of water, of baptism, and the Holy Spirit. Be made a child of God. Born again. Romans 6 says, we were therefore buried with Christ through baptism into death. So that in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too might live a new life. Now Martin Luther, remember that guy held up in that castle translating the Bible from, from Latin and, and Old Greek and Hebrew into German now? So he says that every day we must die and be risen again in Christ Jesus. 
He says that it's not just, and and I'm not talking that first time that you come to belief, that first time that that you're saved, but, but this sin that every day we fight, that sin every day must be put to death. Repentance, confession and forgiveness. We did it today. And see, Martin Luther said, the old sinner in us should, by daily repentance, be drowned and die with all the sins, evil less, and again a new man, a new woman, come forth and arise, we sang arise, who shall live before God in righteousness and purity. We have been justified By the death of Jesus Christ, we were bought with a price. We belong to the Lord. You are his daughter. You are his son. You belong to him. And now every single day as we yet fight the good fight here on earth, as we yet fight those battles, as we yet sin, saved but still sin, the Lord is coming after you with his Holy Spirit to call you to repentance to sanctify you, to keep you in that faith. And so every day we die to sin and we are born again to Christ Jesus. Sanctification, keeping with Christ, that's where we are alive. So be alive. Don't be dead. (laughs) Not by your actions, but by the action of Christ Jesus day after day. So uh, maybe you heard that Footprints poem. You know, there's that poem where there's a a person walking with the Lord and they're walking on the sand and there's two sets of footprints, but in the man's really tough times of life, there's only one set of footprints. And so he asks the Lord, um, why in my really tough times, why did you leave me? And Jesus says, no, those are the times that I carried you through the really tough times of life. And so I love this little cartoon has been going around on Facebook lately where it says, my child, I never left you those places with one set of footprints. That's when I carried you. And that long groove in the sand over there is when I dragged you for a while. <laughs> and we get that. Even here in West Omaha that sometimes we think we can do it all on our own and we can be stubborn. <laughs> But we will hit those times in our life that we cannot save ourselves. And the reality is it's going to happen every day. And our kids are running into that at school. And we need the Lord Jesus to pick us up and carry us or drag us if that's what it's going to take. Isaiah 29 says, Once more the humble will rejoice in the Lord. The needy will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. When we think we're safe, we are vulnerable. But when we are vulnerable, when we are needy, that's when the Lord takes over in our lives. Let us pray.